Hello, Void and all who inhabit it. It's me. And if you're one of those people who doesn't believe in colorism, I'm going to need you to just go ahead and click off this video. So I was looking up more stuff for Lovecraft Country, looking to add quotes and links for my character development video cast, and I noticed that a lot of people will rebuke criticism of how Ruby was written by pointing to her clothing, her being seen as desirable, and her outward confidence as major pluses for her character. It's rare we get to see dark-skinned women, let alone plus-sized dark-skinned women in television who are sexy, well-dressed, and proud. Which is true and led me to start thinking about the dark-skinned women we are shown as desirable. And while they may rarely be seen, they do share a lot of key traits, enough to be a trope. Then I watched Bad Hair. <sighs> There's so much that could be and has been said about that movie. And by the time I upload this, I think it will have been on Hulu for like a week. However, a character I haven't seen talked about as much and who immediately stuck out to me was Sandra. If you haven't seen Bad Hair, and I wouldn't suggest that you do, Sandra, as played by Kelly Rowland, is a late 80s, early 90s pop star. She is the movie's Janet Jackson, Whitney Houston type figure. She has very few scenes, but is set up early as a rising icon and longtime idol for Anna, the main character. Sandra is stunning, she is poised, she is ambitious, and there is something deeply wrong about her. Sandra is the desirable dark-skinned woman. To get to the heart of the desirable dark-skinned woman trope, we should first look at the three major stereotypes slash tropes Black women have been strapped with since the beginning of TV and film in the U.S. Since the beginning of literature in the U.S., to be honest, girl, there is the Jezebel, who, not to be confused with a website or a biblical figure, is the hypersexual promiscuous temptress. The Mammy, who is the maternal, often asexual figure, usually a maid for white folks, literally and figuratively. And the Sapphire, who, as the origin of the angry black woman stereotype, is the aggressive, domineering emasculator of all who stand before her. These aren't the only tropes that exist for black women in Anglo-American media, but understanding this foundation helps us see how other images of Black women have come into being, both negatively and positively. Rapid fire vocab lesson, what's the difference between a stereotype and a trope? A stereotype is an oversimplified generalization of a person or a thing. A trope is a commonly occurring theme, device, situation, or image in media. Tropes may include stereotypes, but all stereotypes aren't necessarily tropes. Tropes function more like archetypes. They are templates from which we build a character, for example. The major difference between those two is that tropes are culturally specific. None of these things are inherently good or bad. Stepping out of English 101 class, the trope of the desirable dark-skinned woman is one such image with roots in these two ye old racist stereotypes, the Sapphire and the Jezebel. While the traditional sapphire stereotype depicts an aggressive woman whose assertiveness drives away love, the desirable dark-skinned woman trope morphs that energy into ambition, typically related to her career, but this can also just be a desire to get rich or die trying. From the Jezebel, we pull the idea of her sex appeal being used as a tool or a weapon, but notably, there is the veneer of agency in said sexiness. She knows what she wants and she's not afraid to ask for it, which, at face value, isn't a bad addition to women in TV, but within this trope, sex appeal remains a tool either for her explicit use or for the narrative to use to ensnare her character into a shallow storyline, or both. I also want to point out that there is an extra spin on this aspect of the trope that pops up in most of the few times we see dark skin plus size women being desirable which is that sex appeal is presented comedically or via a comedic relief character. It's giving very much, I can't believe she actually got pulled like that. That's so funny. If we look back at Sandra, we are being given a repeated set of culturally specific images and character traits. But like I mentioned, she is in very few scenes. 
and bad hair is a film, not a show. So while she provides a quick glimpse at the desirable dark-skinned woman trope, there are more fleshed out examples. If you look at the media renaissance that is 90s black television, you'll see a lot of attractive dark-skinned women. But notice that a lot of these women are also antagonistic. My two faves are Maxine Shaw from Living Single and Pam from Martin. Both of these women are framed as loud, abrasive, and aggressive. Even in storylines where they are loved or cared for, we have to be reminded that they are still the angry one. One of my favorite episodes of Living Single is when Max and Kyle sneak off to a hotel for the weekend. As the episode carries on, we see them dissolve back into bickering and fighting, and while they end their weekend with a kiss and the suggestion that their relationship just will always have an aspect of back and forth, it's also a reminder that Max is rarely allowed to be soft for a whole episode. Likewise, Pam is only shown in a long-term relationship with Tommy, and that barely lasts for more than a season. Though these women are attractive, are shown to be desired by somebody in the story, they aren't the characters the show wants us to find the most attractive. That award goes to Regime and Gina. The best and first instance of the desirable dark-skinned woman trope I saw growing up was Tony Childs from Girlfriends. From day one, Tony is introduced to us as the beautifully black bougie one. She is the Regime, she is the Whitley, she is the one. And while she is full of faults, she is a dark-skinned black woman being shown as desirable, as actively sexual, again and again, not just for a rare short story arc or a one-off episode or to pair her with one person specifically. Tony is the fly, hot, sexy, and beautiful one the whole series long. But more so, what separates Tony from say a Laura Winslow, is the idea that Tony is deeply flawed. At the end of the day, there is still something to her that you shouldn't like. Despite girlfriends having an ensemble cast, the main character is very much Joan. And Tony is very much her main antagonist for the six seasons she's on the show. Their friendship does not dissolve amicably, and even the storyline of Tony's departure is rooted in conflict. This is important as it highlights the last crucial aspect of the desirable dark-skinned woman, her inherent and unavoidable acidity. Future television shows won't portray their desirable dark-skinned woman as drastically, but that is in part because shows with similar setups to Girlfriends are rare. We don't have a lot of shows that focus on the intimacy of friendships between grown women, let alone black women, and most ensemble female casts or all women friend groups we see on TV after the show are not majority or entirely black. We're most likely to see dark-skinned women within family dramas or as one of a few, if not the only, black character in a cast, which is important for two reasons. One, it shifts the way their toxicity is framed. Making Michaela Pratt, for example, a colorist wouldn't have had the same impact as making Tony one, not just because of the audience for how to get away with murder, but because of the cast. After season two, Michaela is the only black member of the Keating Five. And honestly, until Gabriel and Tegan appear, we really don't see her interacting with any black people other than Annalise. Family dramas created after 2003, if they even have a dark skinned woman, will often portray her as the odd one out or the outcast of the family. An excellent example of this is Candace Young from The Haves and the Have Nots, who is evil or more explicitly, has a tense relationship with her mother due to her Jezebel-esque activities. Another example from a better written show, though she doesn't fit within this trope, is Charity from Greenleaf. I'm admittedly not up to date, but at least in the first season, it is very clear that nobody in the family really gives a shit about Charity. Even when she points that out fairly early in the show, it's just taken as whatever, Charity's again. Unlike Candace, Charity seemingly has no reason for being the least loved child. She just is. Your best options to the contrary are shows that feature multiple dark-skinned women, which are few and far between. The other importance of seeing dark-skinned women in larger, less black casts is that we often see them partnered with white men. And look, a lot of people still don't like the idea of interracial relationships. That's just the truth. 
especially if one of the people in the relationship is a black woman. Some shows see that continued societal tension as something to weaponize against their black women characters. When we're looking at dark-skinned women in general who are placed in the interracial relationships, there are two types. The narrative character-driven choices that are met with feral racist fans and the deliberately controversial choices. When you look at most characters with the desirable dark-skinned woman trope who even get relationships, their relationships typically fall in the second category. Let's look at two couples in opposite camps. Michonne and Rick from The Walking Dead and Nova and Calvin from Queen Sugar. If for no other reason, then both the men are slash were cops and both of the women have locks. While one show builds up a relationship irrespective of the ickiness some viewers still feel about interracial relationships, the other show creates the relationship specifically to capitalize on that tension, even more so by making the white man a cop. The result is while Michonne's relationship with Rick is woven into her character arc, Nova's relationship with Officer Friendly is a springboard on which to doubt her moral fiber. You can replace Nova with Ruby from Lovecraft Country, a woman who very much does fit this trope, and have a similar impact. At the end of the day, a desirable dark-skinned woman has to have at least one tragic flaw that pushes the viewer to question and potentially reject her desirability. How desirable can she really be if she believes X, Y, Z? If she's willing to do this, that, and the third? If she wants ooh, ooh, ah, ah, whatever? The way a lot of shows introduce this flaw, if not outright choose this as her main flaw, is to pair their desirable dark-skinned woman with a white man, particularly a white man who ain't sh- The result is a reaction from viewers that think, This woman is so smart and so beautiful, but she's in this relationship? The narrative is negging its own characters and encouraging the viewer to as well. Mind you, wanting to wrangle an Alaskan bullworm isn't the only tragic flaw available. Maybe she wants to be the Alaskan bullworm. Maybe she arranged for the deportation of an immigrant. Maybe she robs motherfucker. Maybe she's possessed by her weave. Whatever it is, there is something rotten about the desirable dark-skinned woman at her core. And there has to be for the purpose of ultimately drawing viewers attraction away from her. Because the desirable dark-skinned woman isn't actually supposed to be desired. Let's recap. Our desirable dark-skinned woman is poised, confident, sassy. She is ambitious, almost cutthroat even, and potentially aggressive. And she is deeply flawed. No matter how strong and sexy she is, something is still off. Bonus points if she's partnered with a white man. So why build her up if we are eventually supposed to be turned off? Well, the story doesn't want you to feel bad for the inevitable bad shit that'll happen to her. Potentially even want you to root for it to happen. And that is because the desirable dark-skinned woman is still just an object of the plot, not a participant in it. It's because there is a drive to punish the object of the viewer's taboo desire instead of unpacking the insecurity around desiring them in the first place. It's because a lot of creators refuse to admit that they are perpetuators of colorism themselves and don't want to examine why their character can so easily boil down to a caricature once you remove her fancy set dressing. It's because despite an influx of new shows and movies, the white heteropatriarchal dumpster fire that is Anglo-American media culture still believes and wants us to believe that dark-skinned women are less than. It's because of all of the above. At the end of the day, the desirable dark-skinned woman is still a negative portrayal of blackness and black womanhood, not because of her beauty, ambition, or gray morality, but because of an inability for her to have all of those things and still be worth developing beyond her eventual descent into cardboard cutout villainy or death. In the grand scheme of representation, it's not enough to just plop a dark-skinned actress into a shell of a character. I'm not part of the anti-biracial black woman being cast as black characters brigade, nor am I trying to fight every light-skinned black woman in the world. But it is fucked that seemingly after all those sitcoms from the 90s ended, our representation of well-written dynamic black women on TV got lighter and has mostly stayed that way. There's a tendency for a lot of people to say, well, 
at least there's a black woman in the show what more do you want i want rounded dark-skinned female characters i want our collective understanding of who black women are capable of being to be expanded i want media to have more substance than a slice of wonder bread I want writers, directors, and producers who are creating something more than a regurgitated stereotype to be given the platforms to make good stories. I want rounded, dark-skinned female characters. Now, if you're a colorism denier and you've made it this far, your throat may be burning with the building scream that, we're all black, it doesn't matter. And while there are plenty of easily accessible resources kindly explaining why colorism actually very much does matter so that I don't have to, I will say this. As we are producing more and more media with Black women as main characters, we should still be looking at the quality of the content being created. More doesn't mean better. Trading in one shallow set of features worth representing for another is not progress, just because we've switched out the set. I've said this before, and I will probably say it again, but the messaging can be more damaging if we care more that the media has been created than we care about what is actually being said. If you made it to the end, thank you for making it to the end. I think this is coming out on or right before the best holiday of the year don't fight me fight your mama happy halloween there's also a full moon and the election coming up so while i mean this every time i mean it even more right now stay safe i'll catch you in the next echo chamber